referential integrity through the use of foreign keys and primary keys to make sure that that if you've got an order item record and it has an or, the ID of an order, you can't delete the order record. You've got join semantics, enhanced join semantics for inner and outer joins and left joins and right joins and all the other types that we have. And you have transactions, acid transactions with these different levels of isolation. So in the second half of the 90s, these ideas are advanced in the sort of commodity databases that people would use. Not the, not the mainframe things that IBM were creating, but in the commodity databases. And probably the most famous ones of those in the open source world has been MySQL. You look at the history there, it had the first public release in 96. So by then, Beatrix was already an established product. So we had this time when uh, if you were doing small to medium enterprise development, you were using something, you were maybe using something that didn't support SQL at all. In 99, they had the ISAM engine, and we still don't have my ISAM, and we still don't have transaction support. And 2001, InnoDB becomes the default, and we get acid transactions from, from anti-SQL, and we get foreign key constraints for a referential integrity. Jump over to the Microsoft SQL server world. In 95, they had their first big release, which was uh, version 6, and they were working with Sybase, and it came with primary keys and foreign keys. Uh, and, and then in version 6.5, they enhanced the join semantics, so we got those inner and outer joins. In 98, they added some replication and support for Unicode. And then in 2000, we got the full set of referential integrity controls. So these allow you to do things like, say, when you delete a record and there's a foreign key somewhere else, delete the record that has the foreign key. Cascading deletes, set null or set default on um, when referential integrity is going to be broken. And finally, Postgres, another well-known open source relational database. Uh, had an initial release late in the 80s, went through some issues and came out again as a public uh, open source project in the mid to late 90s. You see that in 1999, they added support for transactions and they use multi-version concurrency control rather than the locking systems that MySQL and MSSQL use. And then in 2000, they added foreign keys and joins. If we look at those three platforms, you can see that around 2000, 2001, they started to look like we think relational databases should look. And they had support for, the trans for transactions, referential integrity, and the enhanced join semantics. And there was a time there where they didn't, and you could argue that the features were added to, to uh, get anti-SQL compliance. If we move into the, new, into the new millennium, people that were creating uh, applications and creating websites started to run into issues of scale, for, of capacity and throughput and availability. And the tools that they used to solve these problems often lived outside of the database or were added onto the database platform later on. So we look at the first one, uh, Caching, MemCached came out in I think 2001, and the idea is you put the data that you use frequently outside of the database and pull it from memory, and if you miss the cache, then you go back to the database. Besides application complexity, is now you have to look in the cache and then go look at the database. You've got operational complexity where you now you're managing two servers. You have this problem of thundering herds where if your cache goes down, you've got a lot more requests going back to the database than you had previously. Or if your cache is warming up, it's going to get a lot of cache misses. And as I say, there are, there are only two hard problems in computer science, caching, naming, and off-by-one errors. And the problem with caching is that you have to invalidate the cache at some point. And so you have a consistency problem here between the cache and the database. 
early in the, the 2000s, some clever person came up with the idea of sharding. And the idea was, let's take uh, half a million users and put them on one commodity database server. We'll take the next half a million users and put them on a different commodity database server with all of their data. So it's a horizontal partition through your schema. And we'll keep on going and we'll keep adding servers as we add users. And this meant that if you lost one server, you only lost, say, uh, availability for that half a million users. Again, this added application complexity because now you had to understand where the user was in the cluster and operational complexity definitely was increased. If these are independent servers, you have to manage schema across multiple servers, which adds to your operational complexity and makes life harder. You've got still got a single point of failure for that shard. So if you're one of those half million users who gets dropped because your server's down, in the, in the grand scheme of things, that might not matter too much, but if you're one of them, you're probably a bit upset. And it's hard to grow and keep this system balanced. As you go from, say, four to eight machines, how do you make sure that the capacity and the throughput are evenly distributed? Your new customers might be doing more work or less work than your old ones. So to get some availability, we have replication. We saw that Microsoft SQL had it and MySQL has it. And typical master-slave replication occurs outside of the transaction. And the master does something and it gets federated out to the slaves. The failover scenario there can add application complexity. It might be managed by infrastructure. It might be managed in the application. You've got an unknown asynchronous delay between the master and the slave. And again, you've got consistency problems there, like we saw with caching in front of the database. And potentially, you're wasting resources on those slave servers. If they're just there as a passive failover, you've got CPU and memory and disk that you could be getting more value out of. And finally, the reliability of that slave server is unknown. Uh, you might often hear, well, we failed over and, and that failed. Um, another thing that someone has is you've got infrastructure you rely on and that you use and stuff you can't rely on. So you, you might decide to do some things with that slave. So you might have a write master and a read slave. And again, adding to the application complexity, it has to say, the application has to know, well, this is a write, and writes go to this machine, and reads go to those machines. You're still managing this asynchronous delay in replication, so you've got consistency problems between the two. And you've still got a single point of failure for the writes. Maybe you've got a failover scenario where you can pick a new master. So if we keep going down this path and we have multiple machines, we have caching, multiple machines with shards, and master-slave replication, we have to deal with our database schema. In a relational database, the schema is a really useful thing, and it helps the query engine understand how to run your complicated SQL query as fast as possible. But as you start and add machines and you want to make changes, you have to run alter table. An alter table locks the table and blocks out readers and writers. And that's a problem if you're running a 24-7 operation. If you've got lots of machines, you have to apply that to individual servers. And also, as you go and you've got a, a, a fast-changing problem domain, you often tend towards this situation where you have a lot of columns that are just marked as default null. So a tight, well-defined schema starts to become a problem. In the second half of that decade, we had some really interesting papers published. We start with the Google Big Table paper, which came out in 2006, and it talked about a, data, a distributed fault-tolerant database platform that they built. One of the interesting things in it was the data model. So they'd broken away from the idea of a row-orientated database model that you have in relational database and used these things they called column families where the columns for a row are broken up and is a storage
storage pattern as a storage container and as a querying container. And that, that, that worked well for the sorts of problems that they were trying to solve. Next year, Amazon published their Dynamo paper, again about an internal cluster database that they created. And the interesting thing that Dynamo talked about was this idea of eventual consistency. There's a way for a cluster of machines to return consistent data to, to client requests, even if some of the machines have been down when, and miss some of the right activity. And they might have different physical data, or different data on their disk, but you can still have the cluster give you a consistent result, and you can deal with nodes failing. After a while, you can pretty much assume that you've all, always got some sort of node failure going on once you get enough machines. And then the next year, Facebook published their Cassandra paper, where they talked about how they brought together the ideas of Big Table and Dynamo and several other ideas and created a cluster database to solve their problem of search for their email inbox. Uh, and again, they were dealing with a situation where they had data that didn't fit well into their into a relational database model. They had problems with scale at the time. I think they had half a billion users. And this became a, a, a very popular platform. They released it shortly after onto Google Code, and then it became an Apache incubator project. And then we ended up having web, web chats like we have today because of these three papers that came out and pointed the direction that we could go in. In the second half of that decade, we had a lot of new ideas in database platforms. Uh, they sort of fall into four broad categories. We have key value stores. Um, there's a platform called Tokyo Cabinet. Redis is a very popular key value store. Uh, Voldemort from LinkedIn is a key values platform and RIAC from Basho. And in the key value systems, they're just, as they say on the pin, there's a key and a value. Maybe those values have some structure to them, uh, like in readers, or maybe they're just blobs of data. And we have document oriented stores, so uh, Apache CouchDB and MongoDB. And these ideas, the client sends a document of key value pairs. The server stores that, maybe an index of some. We've got a very flexible schema. Graph databases uh, allow you to lay out things and we look at the internet and we see graphs everywhere. And so they've become quite popular as well. And the common family stores, the sorts of things that Cassandra, the category that Cassandra falls into. There's a database called uh, Apache HBase, which is now part of the Hadoop platform and requires all the infrastructure of Hadoop to run. And the first reference I can find of that is from 2007. It was part of the Apache Lucene project. Google then took their big table infrastructure and made that available to the public via Google App Engine. And I put two dates there because typically, in typical Google fashion, it was released in 2008 and taken out of preview or beta in 2011. We have Apache Cassandra, which entered the incubator at Apache in 2009 and became a top level project in 2010. And recently, Amazon has made their Dynamo database available to the public through the Amazon Web Services system. So there's a lot of activity in the column family stores, and they're used to hold uh, large amounts of data and provide high transactional throughput. But in general, the systems that we've seen developed uh, in the last five or six years try to solve some common problems that perhaps weren't so evident or uh, issues in the second half of the 90s when MySQL MSSQL and Postgres started. And the common ideas that they revolve around often are that they're a cluster of machines, that replication is built into the core of the system, and that they have either no schema or a very flexible schema so that they can support fast iterations on platforms and support 
semi or, or non-structured data. And it builds around the idea that nodes fail, and if you want to create a highly available, always up application, you have to have a platform that, that accepts that and and can continue to operate in the face of individual server failures. So with that as a way of setting the groundwork for, I think, how we got to having Cassandra, I'd like to hand over now to Robin, and he can talk in a bit more detail about how Cassandra works. Okay, great. Thanks very much, Aaron. So let me go ahead and um, what I'm going to be covering for you today, Aaron's done a great job in terms of telling us what NoSQL is and has identified many of the common players. So one of the things that I want to do now is take you through why you should be using a NoSQL database. Okay, when is a relational database okay? When should you be looking at a, at a NoSQL database? And so I'm going to provide a number of different uh, reasons why you want to go to NoSQL. And then I'm going to show you how Apache Cassandra meets those particular use cases. So before I do that, though, I want to draw your attention to the fact that there's some pretty big claims right now being made about NoSQL. For example, here's a small quote from an article in InfoWorld that says NoSQL is the stuff of the Internet age. That's a pretty big claim. And, and really, what does that even mean? And so if we start to dive down into that a little bit, what really characterizes a modern database in this Internet age? Well, there's a number of different factors you could look at, but I've, I've listed three for you here on the screen. Um, number one, uh, big data. And uh, this is not just hype. This is real. And I'll cover this more in, in a few moments here. But here you're dealing with being able to scale how fast data is coming in, the variety of data, and the volume. And so that's one of the things that really characterizes, I think, today's data age. Second would be the cloud. So a lot of people looking at the cloud, trying to move their databases to the cloud for a variety of reasons, maybe operational efficiency, maybe cost, something like that. Cloud makes a lot of promises. Okay? It promises that you're going to get transparent elasticity, scalability, all these types of things. Is it legit? Is it true? Well, it depends really on the database that you're using in the cloud. Just taking a, an Oracle database and running a single instance of Oracle is not going to give you these things. So you really want to be able to understand what really constitutes a, a cloud database. And then finally, data just everywhere is what I call it. And this is really needing to support data across multiple different locations, physical locations. Those might be different data centers, geographies, uh, different cloud geography zones, that type of thing. And so you'll find these characteristics coming up over and over again when um, the talk is about really what's, what's really a modern database engine, what's it look like, and what are the things that it deals with. So keeping those in mind, let's go ahead now and turn our attention to a number of different reasons why you want to use NoSQL specifically. And the first really just mirrors the very first reason I gave you under uh, the Internet Age databases. First, you have big data use cases. Right? And what characterizes big data is the, the three Bs, the volume, variety, and, and volume. So you have, uh, should, uh, there's a little error on the slide, it should be uh, velocity there. So data velocity, it's coming in very, very quickly, and perhaps from different uh, locations. You've got a variety of data, maybe structured, semi-structured, unstructured data. And then the volume of data. Uh, oftentimes people hear big data and they think, well, that just naturally means terabytes and petabytes. And not necessarily. We have a number of customers here at DataStacks who have very big data use cases, but they don't have petabytes that they're managing. So volume is not the only um, characteristic uh, that really constitutes a, a big data use case. Something else is the complexity of data distribution, because you, you've got all this data that's coming in, maybe high speed, different types, lots of it, and you've got to distribute it around different locations. That's something else that comes into play here. And so what people are really looking to do is to try to what I call future-proof their apps. And so I, I can't tell you how many different people I've talked to uh, here at DataStacks, customers of ours, that have tried a, a particular database, relational data model, um, and hit the wall with it. And they found that they perhaps couldn't add as many patients as they needed per hour for their new online medical portal. Maybe they couldn't add new online subscribers as fast as they needed to. And they never want that to happen again. And so they're looking for something to ensure their success in the future. And this is where, again, big data technologies come into play. And one thing that analysts tend to agree on is that you need something other than a relational database. So I have a quote here on the screen from IDC that says, really, big data technologies, it's not relational. It's really something else. And this is where NoSQL comes into play, and specifically Cassandra. Cassandra is a massively scalable 
NoSQL database. That's what it was architected from the ground up to do to handle big data workloads. This means that it's going to give you very strong write performance for data velocity. It's going to support the various data types that you need, unstructured, semi-structured, all of that. And it's going to offer you linear scalability for your data volumes and or handling your concurrent users. So, for example, if you are uh, currently seeing around 2 million transactions per second with two nodes, you're going to get 4 million uh, with four nodes and continue to work up from there. It is a true linear scale database. And Cassandra is good for both reads and writes, very fast for both. Cassandra used to be known as a very uh, strong write database. In other words, it would accept data very, very quickly, but it didn't offer very strong read performance. And with version 1.0 of Cassandra, that's no longer the case. Basically, reads and writes are just about on par here. And I've got a quote on the screen from one of our customers here, Source Ninja. So they were using a typical relational database, needed to scale. And since moving to DataStax Enterprise, which is our production-ready version of Cassandra, along with Hadoop and Apache Solar for Enterprise Search, uh, you can see the quote. They said, you know, we've seen basically a 700% performance improvement, um, while at the same time our database grew over 500%, and we've cut costs by 40%. So not bad. So the first reason you want to go to NoSQL, you have a big data use case. When big data is talked about quite a bit, performance comes up. You know, how really fast will the database run? How will it perform under these types of workloads? And, you know, the, the benchmarks now for NoSQL databases are starting to come out. And at least the ones that we've seen, um, there's, there are some clear indicators that Cassandra is not going to disappoint you where performance is concerned. So at the top of the screen here, I've got a quote from a, um, a recent academic benchmark that was done, presented at a very large database conference here this year. And they tested a number of different uh, NoSQL contenders. And uh, in the end, they said, look, in terms of scalability, there's a clear winner. Cassandra achieves the highest throughput, the maximum nodes in all experience, experiments with linear increasing throughput. So it doesn't matter whether it's in the cloud. And you can see a, a benchmark there done by Netflix. Whether it's in web apps, you can see a, a, an external benchmark there done against uh, one of uh, Cassandra's NoSQL rivals. Cassandra really doesn't disappoint where performance is concerned, um, whether it's big data workloads or not. Okay, secondly, why NoSQL? Why do you want to go to a NoSQL database? Number two, you need continuous availability. And this is different than high availability. What we're talking about here are applications that simply can't go down. So that means whether you're doing maintenance, that means whether there is a particular disaster, uh, hardware failures, those type of things. No, your application cannot go down. And it may involve one or more uh, locations. So maybe you have multiple data centers that are serving up different clients all over the globe. So you need that continuous availability, and you need it everywhere. Well, here again, Cassandra really shines. It is a continuously available NoSQL database. So it was, again, architected to overcome the fact that hardware failures can and do occur. So built into Cassandra, what you're going to find is no single point of failure in uh, however it manages data and function. Okay, so you get out-of-the-box redundancy of function and data with its built-in replication, with its architecture where every node is the same. You're not going to have an issue in terms of availability when it comes to Cassandra. Here we have a quote on the screen from one of our customers, WriteScale. And the primary reason they say that they chose Cassandra was because they needed that continuous availability. Their app can't go down, and they have multi-data center support. So that when they write data, there is no worry that it's going to be written. So that's not point number two. Why NoSQL? You need a continuously available database. Number three, you need true location independence. And this may sound like a funny term, but what it basically means is you need to be able to read and write your data anywhere. Now, as Aaron was talking about earlier, there's a number of different architectures that can perhaps get you reads. Okay? Um, few can get you writes as well. And that is a problem that the NoSQL databases like Cassandra overcome. So if you need to read and write data anywhere in multiple locations, you have one logical database that perhaps is made up of many different physical locations, this is where a NoSQL database like Cassandra comes in. And how it handles the various operations, the data itself is going to be eventually synchronized in all locations. And you want to keep data local, perhaps for very fast access. So if I'm here in the United States and uh, I need uh, doing some queries or looking up some data, doing search or whatever, I don't want to have to wait for a query to be satisfied in a, in a server that's uh, tens of thousands of miles away. I want to keep my data very local for fast access. 
And again, this is where Cassandra uh, can help out. Because with Cassandra, you get out of the box multi-data center support, really that is the standard in the NoSQL database uh, industry. Uh, really the standard for multi-data center support, multi-directional capable, and it allows you to create uh, clusters that are hybrid in nature. Perhaps you need uh, some data on-premise, some data in the cloud, those type of things. You can do that with Cassandra very easily. It also offers something called tunable data consistency. And I'm going to go into this a little bit further in just a moment, but it plays into this whole idea of Cassandra being a location-independent database. And this particular feature helps customers like Netflix to be able to create their systems very, very quickly and service their customers all over the globe. Another reason, point number four, why you want a NoSQL database, you need real-time transactional capabilities. Now, some of you may think, now, well, wait a minute. I thought NoSQL didn't do transactions. Well, let me clarify this a little bit. So with transactions, you have something, an acronym called ACID, that is typically applied to relational databases. And if you need true ACID level compliance, you can get by with a relational database typically. Now there are some NoSQL databases that, that uh, will try to give you ACID and, and what have you. Uh, but by and large, NoSQL databases don't look to really support ACID in the sense that it's defined in, in the sense that it's defined in the relational world. Okay? And what I mean by that is that the C in ACID does not apply to really the NoSQL database, a NoSQL database like Cassandra. It refers to referential integrity, foreign key constraints, and with um, databases like Cassandra, you don't have uh, those types of mechanisms. You don't have joins and what have you where you're going to need to support that C in the relational uh, database ACID definition. And in fact, some people don't think you really need uh, ACID-style transactions for many of today's modern applications. I have a quote here from Dan McCreary um, on the screen um, where he asserts that 95% of the apps that he sees right now, they don't need ACID transactions. Now, that doesn't mean that NoSQL can't support transactions for you. And indeed, Cassandra can. It excels in real-time NoSQL transactions. It supports the AID portion of the transactional definition. So you're going to get uh, an atomic, isolated, and durable transaction. What it does a little differently is, again, dealing with that C part of the ACID definition. So again, you're not going to have foreign key constraints and referential integrity to deal with. Instead, you're dealing with consistency and how data is made consistent across many different machines, many different database clusters that perhaps are in multiple locations. And again, as I mentioned earlier, this is where Cassandra offers something that's, that's kind of unique, tunable data consistency. What this means is you have the flexibility to choose on a per operation basis how consistent a particular operation that you're performing is going to be in the database. So for example, if you want a write to be propagated across all nodes, across all different locations, and all must respond back before that transaction is complete, you can do that. You can specify that on a single insert, a single update. Perhaps other writes, though, other inserts and updates, you don't need that type of uh, assurance that they made it to all nodes. Maybe you, could, maybe you just want a majority of the nodes to respond, or maybe you just want no, one node to respond. The whole thing, though, is you get to choose. You're in charge. On a per-operation basis, you have a lot of flexibility from a development perspective to make this happen. Okay, so again, why might you choose NoSQL? Something like Cassandra, you can handle real-time NoSQL transactions. And I got a quote here from Wikibon that says, really, Cassandra stands at the front of the NoSQL pack when it comes to supporting things like this. Another reason why you want a NoSQL database, you heard Aaron talk about this a little earlier. You need a more flexible data model. All right, relational data models, the COD date data model, very good, serves its purpose, but it is rigid. All right, and perhaps the particular applications you're developing Need to be, uh, you need a little bit more flexibility, a little bit more agility. You don't want to have to worry if you have uh, what are called wide rows of data, maybe uh, data that's made up of uh, hundreds or thousands or even tens of thousands of columns. Well, again, a, a database like Cassandra handles this very, very well. Now, the good news, if you're coming from a, the relational world like I was, is that you're going to, to see some things that look very familiar in Cassandra. So Cassandra uses the data model big table, the row-oriented column structure, very similar to relational table, but it's going to give you more flexibility and agility. So for example, I could insert a row into a Cassandra, what's called a column family, 
and uh, maybe contain metadata about myself, and it only contains a couple columns, maybe 10 columns. Then I need to insert a second row into that same column family about you, and maybe you have a thousand different attributes that I have to track. Well, the good news is I can do that. I can insert that, that particular data about yourself, keep the one about me all in the same data with no storage impact, no, no storage overhead issues, no uh, query issues that, uh, that you need to deal with. It's all handled by Cassandra very, very well. There's other things that are very familiar to you. So, for example, you have primary keys. You have secondary indexes that you can create for faster access. So you have some very nice things that, that, uh, that you don't get in the relational world, but at the same time, the learning curve is not very high at all in terms of understanding the data model and understanding how things work. One of our customers here, NASA, uh, they went to a NoSQL solution from a relational database they had, and they were very pleased to see that they were able to do things much more naturally, they said than the relational database was forcing them. And the data model also delivered much faster performance than they were getting from the relational database. So the very last reason why you might want to choose a NoSQL database is you just need a better architecture. Now we've talked about some of these things already, but I really wanted to bring it out explicitly. So again, earlier you heard Aaron talk about the different types of architectures that you might be using with relational or non-relational and such. So you have master-slave, and if you're like me with a background in databases, I'm sure you've done all of these. So master-slave um, has various issues that you have to deal with, most notably a write bottleneck. Uh, there's latency replication issues between the slaves and the master. Then if the master fails, the failover has to occur. Then uh, what, what oftentimes you don't hear talk about is failing back to the master what's brought back online. That's usually very tough to do. So you have those things to, to take care of. Manual sharding, very difficult, oftentimes done in an application um, and requires quite a bit of elbow grease on the part of the developer to make it happen. Then you have the shared storage model architectures that have availability concerns since that storage uh, area could be a single point of failure for you. Well, again, a database like Cassandra overcomes these limitations, overcomes these issues, because it's a masterless architecture. It's a peer-to-peer -peer design where every node is the same. What that means to you is you're not going to have those right bottlenecks. You're not going to have to do manual sharding because it's automatically taken care of for you. You're not going to have the shared storage issues because you're using local storage that's replicated and you have redundancy automatically built into the system, and this equates to less operational overhead. So you're not going to have to have as many people taking care of a Cassandra cluster as you might some sort of a manually uh, uh, put together um, sharded uh, relational system. And I have a quote here from Backupify that said, you know, when we were looking at different uh, systems, saw that Cassandra had all this built in, and we thought, yeah, that's how you do it. So again, just to summarize, why might you come to a NoSQL database like Cassandra? Well, you need to handle big data use cases. You need continuous availability. You need a real location-independent database. You want a real-time, modern, transactional database. You need more flexibility and agility in your data model. And you need, just need a plain, better architecture to take care of things. So what are some of the types of use cases, real-world practical use cases, that a database like Cassandra can tackle? Well, I've listed a number of them here. It's certainly not exhaustive, but real-time big data workloads. Uh, Cassandra excels at time series data management. So if you have financial tick data, you have web click screen data, you have data that's coming off various devices, uh, oftentimes called data exhaust, it really does a, a wonderful job with these types of, of systems. Social media, uh, real-time data analytics, online portals and write intensive systems, and on and on. These are the types of use cases that Cassandra really excels at. So I've got a, a quick screen uh, pick here of the uh, CO's Guide to NoSQL, which I thought was a pretty good study. I would definitely recommend you, you take a look at that. Um, McCreary says, you know, when you really get down to it, what are some of the benefits you're going to derive you, you, outside of the technical benefits that I outlined and some of the technical reasons why you want to choose NoSQL? He asserts that you can really build systems much faster says you really don't need uh, the logical data modeling or any entity relationship diagrams. I would caution there, you, you certainly need to put thought into your data model, so I, I might disagree with him a little bit on that. But I certainly agree that you can definitely scale more automatically. You're going to have much lower failure rates with that continuous availability uh, feature characteristics that are built into Cassandra, and it's definitely more extensible. So with that, uh, I will turn things back over to Christian, and we'll go ahead and wrap up. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Robin and Aaron. Uh, we have a couple of questions so far, and I will go ahead and ask those. 
Um, if you do have a question, please feel free to either use the Q&A within WebEx, and we will monitor that and read them out, or use the hashtag CassandraQA, and we will monitor that and read them out. Um, so, Robin, I'm going to direct the first question to you. It is from, and apologies if I pronounce this incorrectly, Hayton Tava. And he asks, how can I use Hadoop and Cassandra together, and where would I go to get it and get information about that? Sure. There's a couple different routes you can take. If you, if you just want to use the open source version of Cassandra, it does have manual integration with Hadoop uh, that, that is uh, offered with it. And uh, it would require some, some manual development efforts to go ahead and construct an integration path between Cassandra and Hadoop, but you can certainly do it. Uh, what I would recommend, though, is if you go to datastacks.com, uh, we have our Datastax Enterprise Edition, which integrates uh, Apache Cassandra, Hadoop, and Apache Solar all together in uh, the same set of software that allows you to build a database cluster that automatically integrates Cassandra with Hadoop with Solar. And it's automatically built in. There's nothing special you have to do. You basically just install the software, start up the different nodes in the mode that you wish them to be in. So you might start, let's say you wanted a 10-node cluster, and half uh, might be Cassandra nodes, half might be Hadoop nodes. Uh, you could certainly do that. You would just start the nodes up in their uh, respective order and um, their respective quote-unquote personality, whether it's real-time with Cassandra or analytics with Hadoop. Then when you insert data into those various nodes, it's automatically going to be replicated uh, to, to the different uh, subsystems. So it's, when you insert data on the Hadoop side, it's going to be replicated to Cassandra. When you uh, insert data in Cassandra, it's automatically going to be replicated with Hadoop. So if you just go to the downloads page on datastacks.com, you can download Datastax Enterprise Edition, completely free to download um, there and, and completely free to use for development purposes. So if you uh, feel free to download and develop to your heart's content with Enterprise, that's what I would really recommend in terms of getting started with uh, a, a bundled or integrated Cassandra and Hadoop uh, distribution. Great. Thank you very much, Robin. Um, next question. Uh, from Jose Mendez. Uh, Aaron, you take this one. Um, and just a really short answer on this, I think, as we covered it in the webcast. But so you think that the future of database is columnar as in its time was relational? Question mark. Yeah, one of the things that I think we have to deal with now, sorry, is fast changing fast-changing problem spaces and different sorts of data. In the 90s, database books talked mostly about slowly changing problems, uh, accounting systems and banking systems, and the modern sorts of data that we deal with uh, from the internet and from sensors and uh, health data and things doesn't fit too well into a tightly structured, row-based relational model. Great, thank you very much. And uh, Aaron, you take this one as well. Um, this is a follow-up question from Hayton, and uh, he says, if I'm in production with 10 column families, how do I add more column families without harming my infrastructure? So the story of schema changes in Cassandra is one of uh, it being a little bit painful and now it being essentially easy and essentially the same as you would with a single relational database. Coming up in version 1.2, we have support for concurrent online schema changes. Nowadays, you can make online schema changes, but you don't advise them to be concurrent, meaning that you have to take a little bit of care when you're doing them, don't have two people hit the button at the same time. In 1.2, We'll manage all that for you in, in Cassandra, and you can add column families to your heart's content. Just the same, though, as in a relational database where you add more tables and your database has to do a bit more work. In Cassandra, if you add lots of column families, we're talking in the hundreds, then, you're, then the Cassandra server has to do a bit more work. So if you're at 10, you can just throw a query, uh, throw a query over to Cassandra, and we'll get to work and create that column family for you. Thanks, Aaron. And uh, one more um, for you, Aaron. We'll stick with you. Uh, I have a four-node cluster. 
What should be my replication factor? Good question. Replication factor depends on, on a few uh, factors, I guess. Number one is your aversion to risk. And number two is your expectation, I think, about how, about the data that you're going to get back. So aversion to risk means if a, when you're sending your query and you talked about this consistency idea, if you, we have, Cassandra generally works as a quorum based system. And if you have a replication factor of three, then the quorum is two because the quorum is half the nodes plus one. And and at that level, we will always give you consistent results back if you use quorums for reads and writes. So I would normally suggest that you start with a replication factor of three because that, and use quorum consistency. And that will mean that your database, you have these consistent reads and writes and everything looks the same as when you're in a single relational database server. When you get into things a bit more and you're scaling, you might add replication factor because you need to scale because you want to spread your data further. You've got a very, very high read load, and you can tell Cassandra, hey, um, I, I want, I need to, this data to be on six nodes instead of three, and now I can scale a bit more for my read, for my reads. So I would start with three, and and use the consistency level of core. Thanks a lot, Aaron. Um, Robin, so you don't feel left out, here's one for you. Um, but, but feel free to uh, you know, flip it if you need to. This one from Mike C. Can Cassandra efficiently support data with thousands of columns with secondary indexes on hundreds of columns for searching across a wide variety of data attributes? If not, what is the practical upper limit to secondary indexes supported? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm I'm not aware of any hard limits. I don't know, Aaron, are are there any that you know of? I can't think of a hard limit in the code base, no. Yeah. So I I think you're you know, there, there really are um there's nothing for Mike to worry about. Uh again, Cassandra really is is architected to support um uh, again thousands or, or more columns and uh, secondary indexes at least are there and outside of um some perhaps maybe a little storage or something like that, there's really no limit that I'm aware of that he has to worry about. Thank you. And uh, last question right now, and then, and then we'll wrap up unless um, anyone asks anything additional. This one from Alvin Panugayan. Again, apologies for pronunciation there. Um, is there any way to fine tune the hash algorithm that Cassandra employs, or is it fixed in terms of how it distributes data? Well, that's, and I'll, I can start, and maybe Eric can finish. I, maybe if he's getting to the various um, modes that you can operate in in terms of the data distribution, uh, random is the uh, the default and the recommended in terms of a randomized method of Cassandra. Uh, distributing the data across the nodes in the cluster. There is an ordered partitioner um, that is also uh, available. However, it's typically not recommended for a variety of different reasons. And I'll let Aaron expand on that if he'd like. Yeah, so we have, when it comes to distributing data, there's, there's two features in Cassandra that we use. There's the partitioner, when um, so we have the random partitioner and the ordered partitioner and the random gives you a good sampling, a random sampling of data across all your nodes, which allows you to partition capacity and throughput. But then on top of that is the idea of the replication strategy, which determines how data is distributed as well. And nowadays the default replication strategy in Cassandra is called the network topology strategy, and that's the one that allows you to say, uh, use a replication factor of three in my East Coast data center, a replication factor of three in my West Coast data center, and in in the middle of the country, I've got my uh, on-premises on cluster, and I want a replication factor of one, perhaps in there, because I just want the data in there so that my developers can come along and, and touch that and hit that, or it's just for backup purposes. Thank you very much. And uh, actually, there is one more question, which uh, um, 
Aaron, you, you take this one. Does Cassandra offer snapshots and clones? This, that yes, is so from uh, Dennis uh, Gayadine, by the way. Yeah. So there's a, a utility in Cassandra called NoTool, and it can do snapshots. And when we do a snapshot, we flush everything from memory onto disk and then use disk-level uh, hard links in, in Linux to do a snapshot of that data on disk. Uh, people use that to then run their uh, backup systems. It might be when you're doing an upgrade, you do a snapshot so that you've got your data from before you upgraded, do your upgrade, check the box if everyone's happy, and delete those snapshots. You can also use those as part of your uh, disaster recovery planning to move data off node onto something like Amazon S3. And Netflix do this and using their open source platform called Priam, which they use to manage their Cassandra clusters. And that also involve, that also lets them take their off-node backups and spin up a, a, a cloned cluster. Uh, so they use this when they move into a new region. They move this when, use this when they launch their European service and they needed to take essentially their Cassandra cluster and stamp it a new data center out over in England. And so they snapshotted, went into S3, and they got it over there. So you can do snapshots for various reasons, wherever you want to snapshot your data, you can take those snapshots and use those to bootstrap new clusters or new data centers in a cluster. The one thing that I'll add about that is uh, there is a web-based management tool from DataStax called OpCenter, which you can go to, to the downloads page and, and download OpCenter, and it uh, supports doing visual snapshots. So you can actually point and click your way through creating a snapshot, scheduling a, a snapshot to run on a repetitive basis, uh, things like that. So that is available for you. Thank you both very much. And I love it when I can answer a question. This one from Mike C. Will these presentation slides be available for download? Uh, yes, they will. From um, datastacks.com, we will put the archive of this uh, webcast so uh, you can go through and, and hone in on any areas you want to, um, and then also make the slides available alongside that. Uh, we will aim to have those uh, up by this time tomorrow, and we will send out a link to all the registrants and attendees when they're available. Um, that is it for today's webcast. Please join us in two weeks' time when Billy Bosworth, the CEO of DataStax, um, is going to talk about transitioning from relational databases to NoSQL. And then uh, two weeks after that, we welcome back Aaron Morton again, who will give a deeper dive into Apache Cassandra um, as an introduction. And uh, some of these questions that uh, we've had today, um, Aaron, it would be great actually if we can incorporate those into your introduction uh, presentation. Sure. Okay, thank you everyone very much um, and uh, look forward to seeing you and your friends back in a couple of weeks' time.